shared. So, I, so the, we, there are allies in this, this battle, and, and so I think we need to take a very big picture look at it. You see, uh, one factor we, we haven't talked about is um, a SNEEP deprivation. I think this has become a major problem in the U.S. population. Um, in the past two or three decades, the number of hours uh, people sleep, uh, spend on sleeping um, has actually decreased uh, over time. Uh, there is very strong biological epidemiological data showing that uh, uh, inadequate sleep or sleep deprivation is associated with increased production of uh, hunger hormones and increased intake of uh, calories and the increased uh, weight gain and, uh, and uh, obesity. So it's not just uh, sleepless in Seattle, it's still sleepless in America everywhere. So this has become uh, even a, a bigger problem in, um, in children because they have their uh, cell phones um, uh, in, uh, with the, in their bedroom, have TV in their bedrooms. And uh, this problem is actually directly related to uh, unhealthy eating patterns and uh, lack of physical activity. Well, I, I think that the community issue um, is something that people in the Washington area can identify with because I think data show we've got one of the worst commutes in the country. You think about how much time all of us spend uh, commuting. When I think about maybe one reason, non-biological reason, women might struggle with weight. Uh, if you're a parent, a working parent, especially a single parent, trying to put a healthy meal on the table while you're working and commuting these are real challenges, so I don't, um, and I think a lot of people fight those battles alone. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know, are there, are there communities that are trying to help um, strengthen families so that it's easier to put healthy food on the table? Yes, absolutely, Esther Dyson is in the room and um, <coughs> Way to Wellville um, is, is a great example of one. Um, I, I also think, um, Absolutely, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has been doing so much on, um, on uh, the wellness front and a culture of health. Um, I would love to see even more investment and even more partnership in efforts like this. Um, I, I also um, just wanted to say I think it's really great um, what the Milken Institute is teaching all of us if we've watched the slides go back and forth. I mean, we know this point about screen time, and we all saw the slides about screens last night, and lower income kids are spending so much more time on screens. I love, I'm a parent of three kids, you know, mm -hmm. I'm ready to know, like, what's the research we need to do here? What research are we waiting for? Um, because it, it's been a while now since the iPhone and the iPad were invented. Of course, there are great things about productivity from those ends, but specifically how children are interacting with them is something that I think we um, could do a lot more to invest in, especially on the research front. And I would be really curious to know what the rest of the panelists would most love to see on the research front. Well, I'd like to see the promotion of um, efficient parenting around screen time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the parents don't know how to, how to control it. Right? You know, they, they pick their battles, and one of the yeah. battles is not screen time. Yes. It is also really interesting. I think what parents hear is, okay, not more than two hours a day from American pediatrics, and then it's like, oh, wait, okay, we're going to go study this a little more. I mean, the messaging isn't also completely clear, and also what the schools are doing um, themselves. We would love to see more investment in what's working well and how to propel that. Well, just to modify my response, I, I think we know what to do. I don't think we know how to do it. And, and we've been focused a lot on what. I mean, this, this panel started focusing on the what and the, and the significant diseases, but, but the how to do it is what we need to learn and, and apply. And I, I don't, as, as a reporter who, who covers, you know, some politics, and I, I think maybe our struggles um, also come from the fact that we as a country aren't really united on what to do about obesity. I think some, a lot of researchers um, will view obesity as a community problem. Um, it's hard to believe in the past 30 years that all of Americans suddenly became gluttonous and more uh, lazier. Um, you sort of have to, it sort of lends itself to the idea that there's a community societal effect. There are a lot of people who don't want the first lady to tell their kid what to eat at, um, at school lunch, right? I, I, I think some of us were surprised at the idea of the first lady telling people to eat their vegetables and go play outside was as controversial. 
um, <laughs> as, it, as it was. Um, so I, I, I wonder if that's part of our problem is that we don't all, uh, maybe everyone in this room, but outside the, outside the room, it seems like there's still, as a country, maybe a lot of disagreement. Is this a societal problem or an individual person's problem? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think as a country, we like things to be simple. We like mm -hmm. quick fixes. I'm a vaccine person. If we had a vaccine to take care of this, <laughs> it would be fantastic. But it's, it's actually pretty complicated. And I think we know some things that work in very intense intervention context, but we don't know how to scale them. And we're really stuck in this, you know, throw everything we have at an issue like obesity or a complex chronic disease like this without... Um, finding ways that we can really diffuse them across the country and reach every community, rural, urban, you know, um, low, and <coughs> low income as well as wealthier folks. And the time between the research project and the ability to scale is just terrible. I mean, it's amazing to me. I'm looking at your nurse's health study and thinking, thank goodness you weren't following my weight gain since 1976. <laughs> but, but I also think it takes a huge amount of investment to do this great quality research we have to find ways to do the scaling research more quickly so that we can get solutions that, that work. Well, I, I have a, um, a, a praise for the CDC on that front and also a question. You know, I think um, the Ad Council and the CDC and the AMA and the ADA did a pretty amazing um, campaign last year on pre diabetes, and I know that you got to a million people, went to the website and took the risk stratification mm -hmm. test. And I mean, in our world, a million people doing anything is pretty great. It was cute animals, um, that's why it worked. Um, yeah, and it was even the one before that, the sort of um, the busy mom and the I love bacon. But I mean, so <laughs> it's great to get to a million, but what kind of investment do you need to get to 80 million people taking this, or even 10 million, 5 million people? What would you like to see? the CDC do? What would you like to see employers do? Yeah. I don't I mean, think Anne can answer that question. Well, no, what I would well, say I'm is our, our most successful yeah. uh, campaign was the TIPS campaign, which really yeah. helps link people who want to quit smoking with smoke cessation. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's incredibly cost effective. It um, has proven results. It's, it's helped, you know, half a million people quit smoking since we've been doing it. And that is just saving a lot of lives. But we know that um, you know, the media environment's very expensive and um, the resources needed to really bring some of these efforts to scale are huge. You know, we've got, we're launching a campaign around the opioid epidemic and we're just able to do it in four states because of the cost of this type of um, intervention. And it seems so like on risk stratification, you're being very smart. So we'd love to see more of that in obesity so, and, and diabetes. Unfortunately, we're, um, we're over our, our time. Um, well, let me say one thing that Anne can't say. And, and that is CDC is the nation's prevention agency. And unless we continue to invest or increase the investment in the CDC, our prevention efforts will fail. These things always go by very fast. and the close of the summit, I'd like to take this opportunity uh, and ask you to join me in, in thanking a number of people here today. First, I'd like to thank all of you for coming and joining us in this effort. We have a lot of work in front of us, but I think there's no better group to try and tackle these issues. Secondly, I'd like to thank the production staff and the hotel staff for the work in making this seamless. And most importantly, I'd like to thank all my colleagues at the Milken Institute uh, for making this happen. Uh, nobody here knows it, but this was our first event that we did as a team of the center. And uh, without their total support and commitment to each and every detail, um, I'm not so sure we'd, we would have put on such a nice program. So thank you all very much. And now we'll welcome the next panel. Thank you.
For our final session, please welcome Chairman of the Milken Institute, Michael Milken, in conversation with FDA Commissioner Dr. Scott Gottlieb. So we just want to give you one more warm-up question. And I want you to know that uh, our FDA commissioner only took him one or two seconds to get this one correct. So here is your question, all you experts on the FDA. In October 1961, the FDA and the American Medical Association hosted which of the following events? There were five events. Which one did they host? You have 15 seconds to talk it over at your table and make your decision. OK, time is up. Uh, who is voting for A? The inaugural summit on medical flim flammery. Okay, anyone voting for A? No one voting for A. B, anyone want to vote for B? Okay, down in front we have B. C, most of the people voting for C, particularly on this side of the room. D, okay, a little less. E, Okay. What's the correct answer? Well, uh, quackery is a clinical term, so it has to be C. <laughs> okay, no, this is what happens when you go to medical school. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the things you learned. Now, you might remember why this was held, the National Congress was held. It sought to eliminate quackery as a major health problem in the United States. So this micro diameter simply measured electrical currents. However, it advertised that it claimed it could diagnose cancer, diabetes, epilepsy, leukemia, infection, hypertension, and tuberculosis. And that's what drove it. So thank you for joining us today. We're honored to have you. So, you have an economics degree from Westland, started your career with a stint at Alex Brown in investment banking, then went and got your MD degree up in uh, Mount Sinai. You advised previous FDA commissioners and served as a venture investor and advisor to companies. You've been on editorial boards, major medical journals, have written frequently and brilliantly, I would say on a long range of topics in major newspapers. Or as some would say, you've had too much experience out of government. How does your background inform your decision making today? Well, look, I have I, the, um, the prior role at FDA, I think, is certainly helpful. I mean, in terms of just practical experience in the agency and, and being able to come in to the agency at what I think was a difficult juncture, but also a time of a lot of opportunity with some recently passed legislation that gave the agency a lot of new resources and authorities, um, and be able to um, try to capitalize on that early. I think the you know, FDA is a, is a challenging environment and has a very steep and long learning curve, and I had gotten over that in the past. And so, uh, so that's been very helpful, and a lot of the, the senior career officials in the agency were people who I had worked with before. But aside from that, I think the the experience in the private sector certainly informs my thinking. I think understanding from, from the other side of the table trying to develop new technologies and thinking about what some of the challenges are certainly helps me think about how I, how I look at policy. I think we often think about, um, as regulators, the direct costs of product development as the sort of key hurdle um, to trying to get new technologies to the market. But I think what you appreciate having been on the other side and tried to think about new technology development is that the biggest cost component or one of the biggest cost drivers of trying to finance uh, early stage development is the time cost of capital and the risk. And those are variables I think um, FAA can affect through good policy. Um, certainly thinking about trying to make our processes more efficient. Um, to affect the time cost of the capital, cut down on multiple cycles of review issues like that. 
uh, and, and trying to help innovators de-risk development programs by putting out more um, guidance, having clearer direction in terms of what the FDA requirements are, what the benchmarks are, how we go about evaluating science. I think to the extent that we could de-risk development programs, that will make it um, less costly to innovate. And those are things that, that, that I think about, and I think the work on particular on the venture capital side that you mentioned uh, does inform that. So um, we, we make a list of what the FDA is responsible for. It's a long list. Foods, drugs, biologics, medical devices, electronic products that give off radiation, cosmetics, veterinary products, tobacco products, etc. And so as we think of that list. You didn't mention baby turtles, but. And baby turtles. Let's tell them about baby turtles. I mean, not many people are aware of this, this issue. So this, uh, this was an issue I spent a lot of time on my last tour at FDA. We were talking about it in the green room prior to coming on. Um, so it turns out, I'll, I'll get this a little bit wrong, so, so bear with me, but it, um, FDA does regulate turtles for salmonella, and the only safe turtle that, that you can reduce the risk of salmonella infection being transmitted by a turtle is a turtle you can bleach. But it turns out that if the turtle has a shell diameter of less than about a centimeter and a half, if I remember correctly, you can't safely bleach it without killing it. So effectively, a baby turtle can't be bleached. But it also turns out that uh, Louisiana has a very big industry, a very big trade um, in baby turtles where they export them um, as babies and they're grown up into large turtles and used, I think, in soup. Um, so the FDA Oof. requirements to bleach turtles uh, put a lot of pressure on the baby turtle industry, which happens to be located in Louisiana where there were some senators who took a lot of interest in this issue during my last tour at FDA. So the, the, the long and the short of it is when you work at FDA, you never know what issue is going to end up occupying a lot of your time. Um, for me, it was baby turtles. So let's talk about another issue that I think most of us wouldn't really be thinking about as it relates to the FDA, and that's Puerto Rico. Tell us a little bit about after the hurricane and the catastrophe that hit Puerto Rico. How did that affect you and the FDA? Well, this has been, um, we've been uh, very focused on Puerto Rico and spending a lot of time on this issue um, and, and the devastation down there. Uh, obviously, a lot of our time is being spent trying to provide direct assistance to the people of Puerto Rico who have been uh, truly devastated by this storm. I, I traveled there about a week after the storm. We have about 100 employees down there, um, and it looked post-apocalyptic. I mean, the, the devastation was, was complete. I don't think anyone ever contemplated a Category 5 hurricane. Uh, di dissecting the uh, longitudinal axis of that island in the way it did. But you ask yourself why we have 100 employees down there, and that gets to the second reason that, that Puerto Rico has been um, a big part of our focus over the last weeks, and that's because there's uh, a good degree of uh, medical product manufacturing located in Puerto Rico. Um, there was previously um, certain tax incentives to locate medical product manufacturing in Puerto Rico, and so a very big industry for manufacturing medical devices and drugs grew up on the island. Uh, fully 30% thir of the island's GDP uh, is comprised of medical product manufacturing, employing about 100,000 people, both directly and indirectly. And upwards of about 10% of all the medical, of the drugs consumed in the United States are manufactured in Puerto Rico. And these include a lot of very um, sophisticated drugs, biologics, um, advanced uh, manufacturing um, for um, new, newer medications, and also a good deal of uh, medical device manufacturing. So there's 50 uh, medical device manufacturers located on the island, about 1,000 medical devices manufactured in Puerto Rico, and these include insulin pumps and cardiac defibrillators and implantable pacemakers and all kinds of very sophisticated medical devices. So this is a vast industry uh, in Puerto Rico that has been substantially disrupted. Um, the facilities that manufacture these products are all off the grid, they're operating on generators. A lot of them weren't meant to operate for long periods of time on generators, and so um, we're running into a lot of challenges maintaining the operations. Uh, for the most part, most of the facilities are at partial production. Some of them haven't gotten back online at all, but even the ones that are, are manufacturing um, aren't manufacturing at 100%. We have found, I found one facility that's producing at 100% of what they were prior to the storm. There's probably others because I'm not surveying the firms that I'm less worried about. Um, but for the firms that I am talking to, and we've talked to dozens, 
you're hearing stories of anywhere from between 20 and 70 percent of normal production uh, out of these facilities. And so if this persists um, and we can't get these facilities back onto the grid uh, probably by the first quarter of 2018, uh, we run the risk of seeing multiple product shortages. But apart from that, um, there's been a lot of logistical challenges. Early on, we had challenges trying to get finished product off the island. Uh, then challenges arose trying to get diesel fuel to fuel the generators. That seems to have been resolved. Now we had challenges over the last week trying to get medical gases to these facilities. They used uh, oxygen, nitrogen in their manufacturing processes. Um, that seems to have been resolved, at least for the near term. So longer term now, we're trying to focus on the power issues and seeing if at least for some of these facilities we could prioritize getting them back onto the grid because there are certain facilities that if production doesn't uh, resume or production should fail because the generators start to fail, um, you can have shortages of some really significant products. What, how have you seen the response of the employers? I think many of these um, medical device and biologic companies, I think they were employing 18,000, 20,000. Medical devices, 18,000. So 18,000 people are employed by the medical device industry. Look, the, the uh, couple of remarkable things, and the first is um, the Puerto Rican people who have returned to work, even as their own lives were devastated and they lost their homes and their families were uprooted, um, they came back to work. And uh, you know, for the first couple of days, the concerns were gonna be, would, would the facilities be able to get their employees back? They got their employees back. I mean. They, they, they are working, um, and it shows the resiliency of the people on the island. Um, the other thing that we've seen is very good corporate citizenship. Uh, when you look at what the companies did, and I've testified on this this morning before Congress and, and talked about this in my opening um, remarks, you've seen a lot of efforts on the part of the manufacturers to um, directly aid not just their employees and their employees' families, but also their outlying towns. And so. The, the, these manufacturers and the facilities maintain a lot of fidelity to the towns in which they're located. Um, and they're literally shipping, I talked to one company that shipped thousands of generators just for their employees and hundreds of tons of aid by land, by air and sea. Um, they are providing direct assistance to help them rebuild homes, low cost loans, direct grants. Um, they're serving three meals a day in their facilities, not just for their employees, but also for their employee fa employees' families. So they're taking a lot of steps down in Puerto Rico. I think it's one of the untold stories to be very good poor corporate citizens. And I think if it were not for um, that kind of direct assistance, and not just this, this sector, but this sector in particular, we, it would be more challenging than it is. Well, I think we're, we wish that story would come out a little more. And I, and I really appreciate, Scott, you talking about that. We have focused a great deal, and, and we should, out of this conference in the last few days on the opioid epidemic. And the focus on people that have dropped out of the workforce, gone on opioids, and this epidemic that's occurred, and the amazing growth of this problem in this slide you can see from the end of the 1990s to today, just a dramatic change in what's occurred in our country today. What role do you see for the FDA, and what is the FDA doing about this issue? Well, we have roles across multiple domains with respect to this crisis. I think the, the one place where FDA can have a big impact, um, look, I'll, I'll back up by saying that this, this crisis has gotten so large that it's going to be hard for FDA to, to certainly to fully address it, but, but even to impact it in a meaningful way. A crisis that maybe 15 years ago was more within the domain of FDA to more directly address through um, issues around the new products that were being approved on the market. And I was at FDA for part of this time, so I think we're all to blame for not, not seeing how this crisis was evolving and would eventually evolve. But a crisis that might have been more within the domain of FDA now is so large, it's going to take a lot of collaboration across a lot of different stakeholders to, uh, to address. But that doesn't mean the agency doesn't still have a very important role to play. And I think one of the most important roles that the agency can play with is with respect to the new addiction crisis, trying to um, reduce the number of people who become newly addicted. We know that many people who do become addicted to opioids become medically addicted. Their first exposure will have been through a valid prescription. And uh, So I think one key is to just try to reduce overall exposure to make sure only properly indicated patients are being prescribed these drugs. And when they are, it's for a duration of time that comports with the clinical circumstance for which the prescription was written in the first place. And so that means no more 30-day prescriptions for tooth extractions. Uh, it, it feeds addiction. It creates excess drugs in, in in homes that then can be diverted. Um, and so we need to do more to um, look at
issues of education around providers, look at issues around how we package opioids, maybe think about packaging them in two, four, and six day packs to encourage different kinds of prescribing but take steps to try to reduce overall exposure. And 90% and of the prescribed opioids are actually for the immediate release form, uh, formulations. They're for Oxy, Vicodin, and Percocet. And so we need to also take steps with respect to that. So we've recently expanded our, our educational requirements and our risk management plans for the IR drugs. Previously, they were only on the 10% of the extended release formulations. We've expanded them to the IR formulations. I think we also have to look at risk benefit, not just in the labeled use of these drugs, but also in the illicit setting. So um, you know, that means looking at how, how the drugs are, are inappropriately used and taking that into consideration as we weigh uh, risk and benefit, not just pre-market, but post-market. Um, and so about three months ago, we recommended the withdrawal of one drug, Opana ER, from the market based solely on an assessment of the illicit risk of that drug and some unique risks that were associated with that drug when it was diverted and used illic illicitly for injection. We also play a role with respect to new technology, trying to find non-addictive um, pain relievers, trying to for find formulations of opioids that are harder to abuse, so abuse to turn formulations. We're going to be releasing um, specifications very soon on how to develop generic alternatives to abuse to turn formulations. I'm going to be talking tomorrow in testimony I'm delivering before Congress about medically assisted uh, treatments, how we try to create additional incentives to both develop better MAT for people who are currently addicted as well as, uh, as, well as incentivize more use of that, those products. And finally, we play a role with respect to enforcement. Um, if you look at where, where the opioid crisis is going now, people are moving on to the low-cost alternative, which is increasingly heroin and, and now fentanyl. And a lot of that's coming in from overseas, and a lot of it's coming in through the international mail facilities, where we have a role to play in concert with CBP, Customs and Border Patrol. And so we recently um, dramatically stepped up our footprint in the IMFs, in the international mail facilities. We tripled the number of FDA inspectors that we have in the IMFs using our existing resources. We quadrupled the number of packages that we're inspecting. We increased the staff that, that we have in our cyber crimes unit um, working on the so-called dark web where we, where we do a lot of track and trace and try to um, find people who are bringing in uh, illicit drugs and particularly fentanyl. And we're, we're going to be working very closely in concert with the Customs and Border Patrol and the United States Postal Service. We have a working group now to try to develop additional steps we can take to try to step up uh, enforcement in the IMFs. Uh, we are simply overwhelmed in terms of the volume of packages coming in that contain illicit substances right now. So I think you've touched every area. The farm and bio companies that are here, the consumer products companies here, the schools of public health, the philanthropists, the disease specific groups, etc., the academic centers from around the country. And it sounds like you've touched areas that each one of them could get involved in from that standpoint. Let's talk about another area, tobacco. Now, part of this is kind of an age area. So many people think today that we've actually solved the tobacco problem in the US and has been effectively solved, or at least well enough to be under control. I don't think many people today, unless you're a little older, remember the fact that doctors, for example, were the leading endorsers of cigarettes and that those old camel ads that, you know, three out of four doctors endorse cigarettes. And you might not even remember that uh, Fred Flintstone and Barney, when you think of the Flintstones, were endorsing cigarettes. Let's take a look maybe if we have that here at Fred and Barney. I don't know if we do or not. We'll find out in a minute. So, okay. The Flintstones have been brought to you by Winston. America's best-selling, best-tasting filter cigarette. Winston tastes good like a cigarette should. So there was no place, even little kids' cartoons, that we didn't see the cigarettes. So this is an area that FDA has done enormous work in and in, in many ways still list as the number one cause to prevent this disease in the country. And give us some sense of how you view it today, the size and scope. Um, and in dealing with this issue, really the approach that was taken initially with kids in elementary or middle school or high school telling their parents, particularly elementary, not to smoke. And I, I think the most dramatic ad I ever saw was in uh, 
Arizona, and I was driving from Phoenix to uh, down to Tempe, and I saw this billboard that says, if your mom and dad smoke, they don't love you because they're going to die. <laughs> okay, so that was probably the most aggressive message that I, that I saw then. How do you address tobacco today in the 21st century? Well, and how big a problem is it still? Well, it's, it's still a very big problem. I, I think there's no more profound thing that we can do um, in, any, in any reasonable period of time, and certainly probably no more profound thing I can do on my watch at FDA than to do something that would dramatically um, bend the rate of addiction in, in combustible cigarettes and dramatically reduce the rate of smoking uh, of combustible cigarettes. And as you know, we have new authorities that give us new tools to try to address this. And so we've sought to address this in a dramatic way by announcing um, about two months ago, uh, a new plan, um, a comprehensive approach to the regulation of nicotine, where for the first time we're going to be using the product standard that FDA has and authority FDA has to regulate the content of cigarettes, to regulate the nicotine content in combustible cigarettes to render cigarettes, combustible cigarettes minimally and non-addictive by uh, reducing the nicotine in combustible cigarettes. At the same time, we uh, extended application deadlines on um, non-combustible forms of nicotine delivery, particularly the ENDS, the electronic nicotine delivery systems, and predominantly e-cigarettes, to pro try to provide more time for new product innovation that we think could potentially be um, less harmful ways for adults who want to get access to satisfying levels of nicotine to do it through non-combustible forms, because at the same time that we were rendering cigarettes minimally and non-addictive and taking away the opportunity to get nicotine through combustible tobacco for people who were addicted to cigarettes, addicted to nicotine, or, or enjoyed uh, nicotine, adults who enjoyed nicotine, um, we did need to provide an alternative. Um, and we see some of the product innovation in the market as one potential alternative, but an alternative that needs to be put through an appropriate series of regulatory gates. So at the same time that we extended the application deadlines, we're going to continue to enforce existing regulations on them, which restricts access to minors and requires certain labeling. We inspect facilities. But we're also going to be getting in place implementing regulations to regulate aspects of those products, features like the batteries, things like kid appealing flavors. How do you regulate um, e-cigarettes to make sure that if they are flavored, they're not flavored in ways or marketed in ways that could be uh, kid appealing? And so this is the policy we're going forward with. We've been advancing this policy. The third leg of the stool is to try to provide for the opportunity for product innovation when it comes to medicinal forms of nicotine. Again, to provide a, an alternative to adults who want to get access to nicotine um, but no longer have that opportunity to get access to it through combustible cigarettes because we've regulated the nicotine content in combustible cigarettes. And so we're providing for um, we're working on a pathway that we think could enable more product innovation in medicinal forms of nicotine, like patches and gums. The reality is there's, there hasn't been a lot of product innovation in this space. If you look overseas in countries like Europe, you do see more product innovation, more claims around things like uh, route of delivery and speed of delivery, aspects of nicotine and delivery that do affect issues like craving and do affect how, how people who enjoy nicotine enjoy the products. Um, and so we want to see more product innovation within the medicinal forms of nicotine as well. And so we, we'll have much more to say on that soon, but that is the third leg of, of the stool. So for a number of years, over a decade, uh, Gary Becker, Nobel Prize winner in Chicago, Andy Grove really built Intel. At our medical foundations would always propose the concept that the FDA should focus on safety rather than efficacy, and that we could speed products to market. And if you talk to a number of CEOs, God, of large pharma, they point out they have more to lose. They're not going to bring any product to market that has negative effects. They've been sued for tens of billions of dollars in the past. And therefore, the FDA should really focus on does it done any harm rather than does it do any good. And if it doesn't do any good, it won't be successful in the marketplace any, anyway. Over that decade, they were essentially pretty much voted down by our board, whether that was right or wrong. What are your views on that subject and that would that spur more innovation or would it quicken the pace to market for products and what is the downside of that strategy? 
Well, look, I think there's more and more opportunities to rely on post-market information and evidence collected in a practical setting to make determinations of uh, effectiveness, and we do do that, especially in contexts where, where we're considering lower risk technology. So, for example, digital health tools, where we um, recently put forward a, a, a platform or, or a framework, a regulatory framework, to rely much more on post-market data collection to, to look at issues of, um, of performance and effectiveness. And there'll be other, there's other areas, even in the new, new, new drug side of the house, where we um, rely much more on post-market information um, to give us a greater assurance that the observed effectiveness that we saw in early stage clinical work or in clinical trials, in fact, approximates the true measure of the effectiveness of a product. And so we do do that in settings of unmet medical needs. Um, and I think there's going to be more opportunity to do that in the future as we get better vehicles for collecting rigorous information in a post-market setting. But the reality is that's not the system we have. The system that we have and the compromise we've made um, as Americans in terms of establishing the FDA uh, is that people do want um, an assurance of safety and they want some measure of an assurance of the effectiveness of the products that they use, particularly um, medical products, particularly medical products that are going to be used to, uh, to help treat serious conditions. Um, you know, if you, if you have one shot at curing a disease and you um, use a therapy that's otherwise not effective, you perhaps have obviated the chance to have effective therapy, and there's a cost to that as well. And you know, when we do have areas of novel technology where FDA hasn't vigorously stepped in, and historically, for example, when you look at cell-based regenerative medicine, that's an area where FDA um, didn't enforce actively for a number of years while regulations were put in place um, and when the industry was still very small. Um, we're now stepping in more vigorously to put in place some implementing guidance, and we've taken some recent enforcement actions in that, in that space. But we do see a small number of bad actors propagating products that not just are ineffective in our estimation, but actually causing a positive harm, actually delivering um, a direct harm to patients uh, from, from our own analysis. Um, and so I do think that there's a role for FDA uh, in providing certainly an assurance of safety and um, certainly a measure of um, a product's effectiveness in these clinical settings. And I think the, the level of assuredness we need around effectiveness does comport to some degree with how much risk providers and patients are willing to take in very informed clinical settings. And in areas of unmet medical need, um, the agency does leave more discretion to uh, patients and providers around those questions. So the enormous portfolio that you have to regulate, protect, things coming in from 100 different countries, the dramatic changes, one of the things we've been focusing on, just the dramatic change in the food chain and preparation of food, the dynamics of that, um, the people preparing it, and, and the different digital deliveries or digital diagnostics today. Uh, you know, when you talk about what's occurred just in the food chain here, you can see the explosion between delivery, creation, using DNA to create products, creating a hamburger without the cow, et cetera, that we're faced with today. What are your priorities? You've talked about opioids, you've talked about smoking, you've talked about the challenges in Puerto Rico. But what are your priorities today, and how can this diverse group that's been assembled today, uniquely assembled, help you? What can we do to help you, and what are your priorities besides the three we discussed? Yeah, I mean, those are, those are some of my highest priorities in trying to address issues of access as well and looking at some of the cost issues associated with medical product development. But, but setting, you know, those, those I would say are my highest priorities, but also the question of looking at how we address areas of very novel technology. We're seeing more and more areas of highly novel technology, whether it's digital health tools or artificial intelligence or cell-based regenerative medicine, cell-based therapies. Well, where... let's, let's take one look at one of those. Sure. Let's see if we have that melanoma video on what's going on in melanoma and potential apps for melanoma. AI and robotics are making advances across the healthcare industry from genetic testing and robotic surgery to cancer research and data collection. Soon enough, you may even run into some AI in the exam room. 
finding the melanoma is like trying to find the needle in the stack of needles. Dermatologist Roberto Novoa is using an AI algorithm to help identify skin cancer. It's basically comparing that lesion to the hundreds of thousands of other lesions that it's looked at. The technology is an experimental mobile version of an algorithm that was modified by a team of Stanford grad students. What we've built here is an algorithm that using a single picture can distinguish between benign and malignant skin conditions. AI expert Sebastian Thrun led their team. So what this can do is it can bring diagnostics to your home. Just take off your phone, take a little image and get as good a diagnostics as you would get if you go to the doctor. So how did they do it? Oddly enough, it all started with dogs. Thousands and thousands of them. The way we train these algorithms is we show them many, many example cases from a particular object class. So for instance, in the case of dogs, we'd show lots of examples of dogs. And then we would test it and understand how effective it is at recognizing dogs by showing it new examples that it's never seen before. A couple of dermatologists approached us and they said, listen, if artificial intelligence can distinguish between hundreds of breeds of dogs, it might be able to do something for skin conditions. In a test, the algorithm matched the performance of 21 board-certified dermatologists. It was also much faster, scanning skin images at about 200 times the rate of a human. With sufficient data, I think that they will outperform the majority of humans. So we see these challenges today, and obviously you're, you're responsible for regulating all these new products coming to market as we look at it today, as we try to think about the challenges you have and what we can do to help you. But there's no limit, as you know, to the algorithms and AI, whether it's, it's going to read your CT scans or your MRIs or it's going to be your pathologist today. And so we just think of the enormity of the challenges that you have. Well, and, and opportunities. Um, and I, I think it's a very unique time at FDA because we have both these scientific opportunities and then we have the backdrop of, as I mentioned at the outset, some recently passed legislation that gives the FDA new tools to try to address these areas. I think w w where I was going, I, I think it's incumbent upon us to think about how we fashion a regulatory framework that's suited to the technology. There are cases where the existing um, regulatory paradigm just doesn't apply well to the new technology. And rather than try to take that paradigm and somehow make it work or make it fit, I think what we're trying to do is think about how we reimagine um, our own processes and our own regulatory touch and framework. And sometimes, in a lot of cases, I think we can do that under our existing authorities. Sometimes we have to go back to Congress, and we're currently doing that. We're asking Congress to talk to us about authority with respect to laboratory developed tests and some other areas where I think Congress can be helpful in delineating a different kind of regulatory framework for certain technologies. But there are areas where we can do it under our, our own authorities. And, and digital apps is a good example where we have uh, piloted what we call a firm-based approach with re respect to low-risk digital health tools, digital apps. So this wouldn't qualify for that, by the way. <laughs> this is a higher-risk product, probably, although I don't know the particular product in question. But, uh, but low-risk digital health tools that are providing consumers information, what we're doing is we're saying that if you're a company that has good validation in place, and we can, we can basically share. So, I, so the, we, there are allies in this, this battle, and, and so I think we need to take a very big picture look at it. Shared. So, I, so do we, there are allies in this, this battle, and, and so I think we need to take a very big picture look at it. See, uh, one factor we, we haven't talked about is um, a SNP deprivation. I think this has become a major problem in the U.S. population. Um, in the past two or three decades, the number of hours uh, people sleep, uh, spend on sleeping um, has actually decreased uh, over time. Uh, there is very strong biological, epidemiological data showing that uh, uh, inadequate sleep or sleep deprivation is associated with increased production of uh, hunger hormones and increased intake of uh, calories and the increased uh, weight gain and, uh, and uh, obesity. So it's not just uh, sleepless in Seattle, it's still sleepless in America everywhere. So this has become uh, even a, a bigger problem in, um, in children because the have their uh, cell phones um, uh, in, uh, with the, in their bedroom, have TV in their bedrooms. And uh, this problem is actually directly related to 
uh, unhealthy eating patterns and uh, lack of physical activity. Well, I, I think the, the community issue um, is something that people in the Washington area can identify with because I think data show we've got one of the worst commutes in the country. You think about how much time all of us spend uh, commuting. Shared. So, I, so the, we, there are allies in this, this battle, and, and so I think we need to take a very big picture look at it. See, uh, one factor we, we haven't talked about is um, sleep deprivation. I think this has become a major problem in the U.S. population. Um, in the past two or three decades, the number of hours uh, people sleep, uh, spend on sleeping um, has actually decreased uh, over time. Uh, there is very strong biological epidemiological data showing that uh, uh, inadequate sleep or sleep deprivation is associated with increased production of uh, hunger hormones and increased intake of uh, calories and the increased uh, weight gain and, uh, and uh, obesity. So it's not just uh, sleepless in Seattle, it's still sleepless in America everywhere. So this has become uh, even a, a bigger problem in, um, in children because they have their uh, cell phones um, uh, in, uh, with the, in their bedroom, with TV in their bedrooms. And uh, this problem is actually directly related to uh, unhealthy eating patterns and uh, lack of physical activity. Well, I, I think the, the community issue um, is something that people in the Washington area can identify with because I think data show we've got one of the worst commutes in the country. You think about how much time all of us spend uh, commuting. When I think about maybe one reason, non-biological reason, women might struggle with weight. Uh, if you're a parent, a working parent, especially a single parent, trying to put a healthy meal on the table while you're working and commuting, these are real challenges. So I don't, um, and I think a lot of people fight those battles alone. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know, are there, are there communities that are trying to help um, strengthen families so that it's easier to put healthy food on the table? Yes, absolutely. Esther Dyson is in the room and um, Way to Wellville um, is, is a great example of one. Um, I, I also think um, absolutely the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has been doing so much on, um, on uh, the wellness front and a culture of health. Um, I would love to see even more investment and even more partnership in efforts like this. Um, I, I also um, just wanted to say I think it's really great um, what the Milken Institute is teaching all of us if we've watched the slides go back and forth. I mean, we know this point about screen time, and we all saw the slides about screens last night, and lower-income kids are spending so much more time on screens. I love, I'm a parent of three kids, you know, mm -hmm. I'm ready to know, like, what's the research we need to do here? What research are we waiting for? Um, because it, it's been a while now since the iPhone and the 